please, if I speak too fast, because when I speak about wine, I get a bit excited. Uh, please stop me. Um, I'm the sommelier of the hotel. I look pretty young to be sommelier, but I started to drink when I was really young. And uh, tonight we're going to speak about Languedoc Roussillon, which is a beautiful wine region of south of France, um, which is pretty complicated to explain actually. So I will do my best to give you the main keys and the basics of this wine region. And of course tonight uh, to support me and to give you more details and more explanation, <coughs> we are very lucky to welcome my little in Singapore, Marjorie Gale. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Marjorie is from the winery Grove des Anges. Um, which she built it up with her husband in 2001 from A to Z, so it's a pretty wonderful story. Um, so later on she will talk about her winery and also about Nom de Croissant. And of course after the class we will have small snacks and wine together, so feel free to ask her as much questions as you want and you know, just to meet up with her. Thank you. So if I say any bullshit, of course you start me, Marjorie. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's start. So Lambert Croussillon, as I was mentioning, is south of France. Have you ever heard about Montpellier? Montpellier is this town, it's a lovely town. Um, uh, it's very famous for students, actually. It's not so far away from the sea. Have you ever heard about Sets, uh, Béziers, all those uh, lovely towns? <coughs> so this is what makes the Languedoc Roussillon region, which looks like that. This is all the Languedoc Roussillon region. In France, we have um, 22 regions, and they are all divided by what we call département. So the Languedoc Roussillon looks like that. We have Lozère, Gare, Hérault, Aude, and Pyrénées Orientales. Why am I giving you those details? It's because when it comes to talk about appellation and Languedoc and Roussillon, <coughs> it will help you to keep that in mind. However, when it comes to one region in France, it's not necessary, the one region are not necessarily the same uh, region that what we call the préfectural region. Meaning that you could have some wine from this area called uh, Languedoc, for instance. It's possible. So but this is just to try to make it clear in your head. But when it comes to Burgundy and Bordeaux, it's not necessary, uh, the one region is not necessarily the same thing than the official one region of France. Okay? So have you ever been to Languedoc Roussillon, any of you? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, talking about uh, exchanging and, and raising hands. Uh, those are small wine corks. People can be formed exactly where they live. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions. If you answer it right, you will receive one of those. And the one of you who get the most of it will have a bottle of wine uh, offered by Marjorie to go back home. So I hope from now we'll hear people fighting for answering the question. But if you annoy me too, I'm, I'm allowed to beat you with <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> so this is a more detailed part. So when it comes to Languedoc-Roussillon region, it's only one one region in France. But when it, it's only one region of France. One of the 22 regions of France is Languedoc-Roussillon. But when it comes to wines, Languedoc-Roussillon is two parts. It's Roussillon on the west and it's Languedoc on the east. Okay. Marjorie, for instance, is from Roussillon, but it's two uh, different parts. So they divide, they divide the vineyard in two parts. When we talk about um, uh, Burgundy, we have Côte de Mi, Côte de Beaune, and Chablis area. When we talk about Languedoc Roussillon, we have the Languedoc and the Roussillon. Okay? This card is very busy, very complicated, but it's the official card of um, the region, uh, the wine region. So if you have it, and you can, uh, when you will start to get familiar with the appellation, look at it. But to make it easier, this one. Yeah. So this is the official one that you're having now. Um, um, so how many parts is Longue Croissant Vineyard? Two. You say it first. <laughs> you say two. <laughs> so some history. Um, I'm very bad at history. I like it, but I never remember anything. <laughs> But basically, uh, what I, I want you know, people uh, in Singapore are usually um, used to drink New World wine. So what I wanted to show you with this is that Languedoc Roussillon is a very, very old vineyard. It's not something that's new. The Greeks brought the vine, <coughs> so it's really old vineyards, and they had you know 
good time and bad time. At the really good beginning, uh, they were like um, the high quality ones and they were even considered as a medicine in Paris, like um, kings and important people of Paris. They were asking for Languedoc Roussillon wine, more specifically Saint Chignon, as a medicine. Then, um, unfortunately, after it became like a massive production, wine production, and um, who say big production say lower quality. So for quite some time, Languedoc Roussillon went through a bad time. And unfortunately, in the mind of many people until now, Languedoc Roussillon could be like the low quality uh, wine, which is not true. That was a long time ago. Um, the phylloxera appeared. Everyone knows what is the phylloxera? Well, you know it's too easy. So. <laughs> Who knows that it's uh, but it, uh, um, not exactly. It's, uh, it's like this. It's like a pest, right? Yes. I give one to Dominique. Oh. Oh. Ah, you can sit. I like to sit for you. You don't? <clears throat> so, yeah, the phylloxera is like a pest which in the late 19th century destroyed the whole uh, European vineyards. So for people who don't know, it's very interesting and important to know that if you go in Europe, 98% um, of the vineyard is not uh, planting on its own goods. It's um, <coughs> cutting with American goods. Because until now, we still have the phylloxera in all over Europe. And it's starting to appear in a lot of space in uh, Australia as well. So everywhere in Europe, you have the American roots, then it's cutting with uh, the French roots. So in 19, um, late 19th century, the phylloxera destroyed everything. So they had to pull out all the vines. The good thing about it is since they started to make massive production with a lot of low quality vineyards and low quality vines, at this time, it gave them the opportunity to restart fresh. So after the phylloxera, they restarted to focus on quality. And since that, they are making pretty good wine. Um, so it's wrong to think that uh, Languedoc Roussillon is the low level wine. Actually, they do beautiful things, and the, the most important things I will say is that they have, they still have good value for money wine, which is not the case in a lot of wine region in France. Okay. <coughs> uh, what the phylloxera did appear? Dominic saying too. I will try to not break in the I will try to not break any glasses. So, why are the American goods more resistant? Absolutely, they are more resistant before we cut um, our vines with the American goods. We don't know why, but they found out that the phylloxera didn't appear on the same way in California. However, there's some part of um, of, um, of US where they have some problem with the phylloxera too. Yeah, in France, like maybe. Uh, less than 1% of the vineyards survive, so we can find really, really old vineyards um, in southwest of France, for instance. But it's because they are in a very sandy soil, and the phylloxera doesn't like the sandy soil. It can't really, you know, mm -hmm. aggregate itself. But otherwise, it's all gone. Yeah, therefore, you won't really see a, older, a very old vineyard in Europe, more than 100 years old, it's impossible. Okay? So, Languedoc Roussillon grapes. I say Languedoc Roussillon because we are going to speak about the grape that we can find all over the region first. But as you remember, Languedoc Roussillon is two specific parts Languedoc on the west, Languedoc on the uh, east, and Roussillon on the west. <coughs> Have you ever heard about grapes produced in the Languedoc Roussillon? He can give you one or two for fun. Grenache, c'est quoi, c'est le Yeah. Grenache blanc. Grenache blanc. Uh, any oh, other grenache? Maybe grenache. It's the mess. I thought it was a mess. You can try anything on it. <laughs> yeah, we're good. It's a go. It's a go. Win often, so you're better to fight hard with it. <laughs> um, when I always give example with other French region because today we're talking about France. When it comes to Burgundy, it's easy to remember, it's Pinot Noir Chardonnay. When it comes to Bordeaux, it's okay, it's Merlot, Cabernet, just three or four grapes. But when it comes to Languedoc Roussillon, it's all of those. 
and actually could be even more. Because in Languedoc-Roussillon, do you remember for people who came before the appellation system? Like if you have a wine from Burgundy, so it's called Bourgogne on the bottle, which means Burgundy, it must be made if it's a red wine of Pinot Noir and if it's a white wine of Chardonnay. It's appellation system that we have all over Europe, which do not exist yet, pretty much, but not really there yet in the new world. <coughs> in um, Languedoc-Roussillon, actually, the winemakers are much more free than the other region of France because they can plant whatever they feel like because they have a very nice appellation called HIT, like they have in uh, Toscany in Italy. So <clears throat> beside this list, I could have had much more grapes for the lowest appellation. Just keep in mind for the grapes that is a big mess. They have plenty of grapes, but the majority of the grapes are those which can take the heavy sun and the, the warm weather. So just in a few words, uh, for red wine, we have the Grenache Noir, which is the most famous. So Grenache Noir gives a very fleshy, round, and generous red wine. The Carignan will be maybe the easiest for the uh, balance. Usually it gives a fresh and um, flesh, fleshy <coughs> wine, but the fresh wine is really good for balanced wine. The Sasso will be the lighter, easy going and round. The Mourvedre will be the more rustic one, with big, massive tannins. The Syrah is not really well appropriated to the south of uh, to Languedoc-Roussillon, basically. Syrah is usually um, a grapes which is the king in the north of Rhone Valley for Côte Rôti, Croix Hermitage, and all of those. Um, as Marjorie was explaining to me just before we started, uh, before Languedoc-Roussillon, they were doing a lot of sweet wines, and when they started to do to make dry wines, they didn't really believe in their old grapes. They thought that. <clears throat> maybe it wasn't qualitative enough. So they planted some Syrah because it was from Rhone Valley and it was a star grape and so on. But <clears throat> it has told them many times that Syrah is not at the right place because Syrah needs some hills and needs some cooler weather. When in a longer Croussillon, it might be too warm for the Syrah. But still, there are a lot of Syrah over the place. For the white wine, the most popular will be the Grenache Blanc, which is very floral. Floral, flo flowers, floral, <laughs> fruity, um, Grenache Gris is about the same but slightly more richer, Bourboulin, Maccabeux, and Claret will be with Mosaic, the easy going, fresh, crispy, bit simple, Vermentino will be straightforward, very fresh, uh, Marsan Roussan is same thing than Syrah, they are from the Rhone Valley, they don't really like warm weather. Marsan Roussan tend to be slightly too creamy around and fast because Langue de is slightly too warm for it. Muscat Petit Grain is very famous and it's very, very aromatic. Sometimes it's even too much. Uh, Pic Pool is very yodin. You know the oyster test? Very yodin. It's right next to the sea, actually. Um, and very, very fresh. So those are the grapes of um, the Langue de Croussillon. Beside you. Who can tell me the name of a red grapes from London Cruci? Are you following me? Oh, you are sleeping. Yes. Or oh, you don't understand my beautiful French accent? Yeah. Yeah. Grenache, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry? Move it, yes. You already said but I gave you again. <laughs> What else? No, I can't. <coughs> Emma, I didn't hear you today. Usually, Emma always wins the bottle of Let's You Could and Rest Five. No? Who says sounds so? You say sounds so good. <laughs> okay, terroir. Uh, for people who came before, I'm sorry, we have to speak about it again, but I think it's always good to refresh things. <coughs> what is the terroir? Emma, you cannot tell this one. Uh, the terroir is all about the winemaker, the weather, and the soil or the topography. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. <laughs> so terroir is a French word, I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> and the roof of this French word terre means the earth. But actually terroir, it's a few criteria together, just like Emma mentioned. Um, <coughs> if you do not understand terroir, it's difficult to understand wine because when you drink a glass of wine, you are drinking the terroir. So terroir is soil topography, weather, and winemaker. 
Why the winemaker? Because the winemaker has a huge impact on the wine. You can have exactly the same soil, working with exactly the same grapes, you can have the same weather condition. At the end, the winemaker is giving the last word. He is the one making a lot of uh, small decisions, or big decisions in the winery, and that will have a huge impact on the final product, wine. So what about terroir in Languedoc-Roussillon? So as you have seen on the map earlier on, Languedoc-Roussillon looks like that. It's on the Mediterranean side. <coughs> and it's what we call, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, but amphitheater. Amphitheater. So amphitheater. So this is good for the wind circulation. But just here, just here we have Spain. And this as uh, Spain, you know, it's very warm and everything. Spain has huge influence on the Roussillon side. So you've got the warm uh, weather, the warm wind from Spain. So Roussillon definitely is influenced by this, the very warm weather of Spain. When a long dog will be slightly different because um, the wind and the warm weather from Spain <coughs> don't go through there. <coughs> um, as Marjorie was explaining to me, their soil is pretty much uh, superficial. They are not very deep and uh, thick, and they are rich, but pretty superficial. What makes the big difference between Languedoc and Roussillon, Roussillon there, and Languedoc here, will be definitely the weather. So one is more influenced by this, by Spain than the other. Okay, any question about the terroir? Do I speak too fast? Are you following me? No, it's fine. The appellation. So for people who came again before, sorry, I will have to repeat myself. <coughs> so anyone can tell me what is an appellation in a few words? Nope, I give the whole bag. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't be shy, you know. No? Okay. So <coughs> basically, um, this is the main difference between the new world and the old world, as I was explaining before. Be careful, I'm not saying they don't have it in the world, but they are just starting. But they are not as far as we are. And the main reason why Europe has a very strong appellation system is just because we are much older vineyards. So we had years and years of experimentation, observation, and we know somehow what works and where and why. Okay? <clears throat> so um, when it comes to appellation, it's basically you have the wine region, Languedoc-Roussillon, and in Languedoc-Roussillon, you have plenty of uh, villages, and all the vineyards around <coughs> that specific area, these villages, all the wine produced from that vineyard will be called by the name of uh, the village. So Colio, for instance, is a village, a small city with a pub, a church, and so on, and all the vineyards around Colio, in a specific area of Colio, all the vineyards and the wine made from those vineyards will be called Colio. Colio has its own rules, must choose a certain time of grapes, must choose a uh, certain time of yield, and there are plenty, plenty of rules to follow to be called Colio. If the winemaker doesn't follow the rules of Colio, he can't call his wine. <coughs> to make it simple with the AZ region, I was talking about Burgundy before, Bourgogne red, burgundy red, if you don't use Pinot Noir grapes to make your burgundy red, you can't call it burgundy, it's forbidden. So same thing, an appellation is a specific rule for a specific area, it's identified. Okay, is it clear for everyone? Or any questions? No? Okay. <coughs> this part is really important, we will talk about it uh, slightly more later on, but <coughs> At the very beginning, um, I was mentioning to you before, a Landa Crossillon, we're making sweet wine, fortified wine. There are those Rizat, Mori, Banyus, Muscat Rizat. All of those are fortified, um, what we call Vendou vin, Naturel, I will explain to you later, wine. And it's a very important part uh, when it comes to talk about Landa Crossillon in general. So those are only the appellation of Crossillon, okay? So the west side. For Landa, we still have some more. <coughs> Cabardes, Claire du Languedoc, Corbet, <coughs> and each of those can use different type of grapes. All the same grapes that we saw on the main board, but some of them are not allowed to use this grape, or some of them can uh, use this grape better. It's really complicated. If you have to remember by her all the grapes that each appellation uh, can keep, it's pretty tough. So I don't ask you to do that, but uh, it's complicated. <laughs> so this is the appellation of uh, Languedoc. Have you seen this? AOP aussi Languedoc, and here was the Côte du Roussillon. This is what we call regional appellation. So 
basically, <coughs> um, if you are in Lambda Crucillon but not in Collioure or not in any of those villages, and you follow the specific rules of Code du Roussillon, you are called Bigo. From your wine is called Code du Roussillon. So it's what we call the general appellation, the big appellation. If you are not in one of those villages, you could be a Code du Roussillon. But again, there are specific area villages. But it's more or less like this. After, if I go into too much details, you are going to find out. And this part it was uh, the part I was talking earlier on is the EJIP. So um, it's what we used to call the vin de pays before. So basically, when you make Pyrénées Oriental or vin de pays d'Oc or all Côte Catalan, <coughs> you are allowed to use the famous grapes I was talking about earlier on. Grapes which are beside the big list I gave you. So this is like, it's not, I mean, I'm not saying it's um, not the good quality or it's below this. It's just that. In the hierarchy, AOC, AOP is above IGP. So basically, those wines will be slightly more expen expensive and they will have a much more strict rules than this one. In other part of France, it could be true that those wines will be the easiest, easy going and simple. But in Lambda Crocillon, it's not true because actually winemakers are using very much those appellations to be more free to do amazing things. Okay, so you can find excellent value for money wine and market Roussillon, especially for this reason, because they are not struggle with this big appellation, which puts them to have more restrictions and um, and just that they're more more expensive. <coughs> are you following me? Yes. Sure. Great. So we're talking about the VDM. So VDM V means wine. D means do, which means uh, soft sweets. <coughs> And means natural. So basically, the VDN of the um, uh, is fortified wines. So it's a wine, um, normal wine making. <coughs> At the beginning of the fermentation, they will add a strong alcohol, neutral alcohol, to kill the yeast. The yeast contact, you know, the yeast who are eating the sugar to making, uh, you know, wine to transform the juice into wine. If you add a strong um, alcohol, the yeast can't take it and they die. So basically, if the yeast don't finish their work of eating the sugar, there is sugar left. And there is, of course, a um, um, strong wine, much stronger wine, because you have strong alcohol on the top. Okay? So it's uh, stopping the fermentation with an addition of alcohol, basically. So why is it natural? It's because the sugar, this wine is definitely natural. We just stop the fermentation with the addition of alcohol. Okay? Any so questions? Pure alcohol to alcohol. Yeah, you ask pure, I mean natural alcohol, pure alcohol on the top of uh, the grapes if it's red or juice, and, and it kills the yeast. <coughs> so the fermentation stopped. So you have left a wine which is sweet and also much stronger, fortified wines. After uh, the winemaker can age their wines um, in barrels or in glass barrel uh, outside or inside, and he will give you um, the Rancio um, fortified wine, uh, a bit like the port style. Port is made the same way actually. Um, it's different. You can have a fresh, fruity uh, fortified wine if they use only tank and they put it in the bottle straight after. So, after you have variation uh, made on the way they age the wines. Okay. So I talk enough. Uh, so it's time to Marjorie to introduce herself and to talk about her wine. I have to do that quickly. Okay. Uh, 
Um, I discovered uh, I'm not from the Languedoc Roussillon. Uh, I'm coming from the Alps. So I've been uh, raised really close to uh, to Cotrotier and Gondrieux vineyards. Uh, these are the first wines I've been uh, I tasted, I I drank, uh, and I think uh, I really uh, came very early to wine because of that. Because the first drops of wine I I, I tasted were with Cotrotier and Gondrieux, and I immediately liked it. Uh, then, because I studied in Montpellier, I discovered, I came to discover the, the, the Languedoc first, because Montpellier, uh, you saw Montpellier is really in the center of the Languedoc Ocean and, and, and in the center of Languedoc. And then, because of my husband uh, find a job in um, a big estate in Roussillon, uh, I came to Roussillon and discovered um, an, a different place. Roussillon to me is wilder than Languedoc. Because it's it's like a, um, a forgotten area between Montpellier and Barcelona. Barcelona is very dynamic, Montpellier as well. But Perpignan is like a dead city between these two very dynamic cities. And uh, sometimes we are just desperate about that because when we have to travel, uh, it's always very hard. And uh, I know this because. Uh, <laughs> took me like a day to come here because of strikes in France. And <laughs> so we always complain about that. But on the other hand, we are really living in a very um, uh, amazing um, environment, very wild. Uh, I live and we settled in a very tiny village. Uh, we are 220 people in a small village called Monet, which is the um, uh, a sh um, shortening of Montenegro. Because the village lies on a very uh, on a small hill made with uh, brown and dark schists, so like black or dark soils. Uh, so this this environment is just uh, great, and I found there um, a tower in to me uh, with the same dimension, the same um, quality as Cotroti. Uh, the soils are made of very superficial schist. Uh, we have like one meter of soil and then we are in the rock. Uh, the climate is uh, very, uh, it, it's Mediterranean climate, but uh, it's not like Nice, it's not the Côte d'Azur. It's really wilder and stronger. Uh, we have uh, quite uh, cold winters, we have hot and dry summers, and we have a very strong wind, all season. So we have, I think we have the opposite climate as a Singapore climate. <laughs> Completely different, really dry. And, and so people always get this uh, uh, like coastal card image of the south with uh, hot weather and uh, uh, nice weather. But the weather there is really, really uh, hard. And a lot of people are coming there to for retire or to create some domains, but they can't stay. Uh, after a few years, they, are, they get sick, they get bored about this climate. And also about Catalan people, because they are not so easy. Uh, and, they, and they leave the region. So uh, it's very important, and it's good to know this, to then understand the wines. The wines will hold this, this uh, hard climate, this uh, hard region in, in, in this time. So uh, we started the domain with 10 hectares, quite small, 10 hectares of old vines, and in 14 years we came from 10 hectares to 35 today, uh, doing some new plantations and also buying some vineyards. Vine vineyard is very cheap there. That's why this region is very nice for young people without any money, because you can buy wonderful uh, vines for nothing. Uh, but you also have to know that these wonderful vines uh, won't produce a lot of wine. That's one big, big point about this specific area of Roussillon, because the soils are very superficial. Because we have no soil, we are in the rock, because the climate is dry, because we have a very old vineyard, the yields of uh, the lowest yields of France. I mean, we are under 20 hectoliters per hectare. Uh, to give an example, in Cotroti, uh, and the wines of Cotroti are sold, I think, twice or twice the price of the wines of Roussillon. They can produce the, the, the maximum uh, authorized yield is 45 hectoliters per hectare. 
In Bordeaux, it's even more. In Burgundy, also. So uh, it, we are in a very, very particular place to produce wine. This, these uh, economical points makes that people who settle there and people who stay there to make wine are really people who are passionate about wine and not passionate about making money. Because you can't make really money there. But what I personally found there is a, a, an incredible place to live because I, love, I like to live in the countryside, I like to live in wild and desert places. Uh, we have this great light all year long because the sky there is really blue. I can uh, try to show you see how blue the sky is always blue like this, and the light is is something that uh, um, when you when you live there for a couple of years, then you you get really dependent to that, and you need this light, and it's so great for for health and for everything for mind. Uh, so that's why, and the wines that we produce there have a great personality. And for all this, I, I, I would not like to settle anywhere else. But the other side is that it's it's really hard in terms of economy. Um, so the the vineyard, the, the a few words about the tower there. Uh, we are between the Pyrenees and the sea, and the vineyard is uh, what we call a Piemont vineyard because we are on the first hills of the Pyrenees. This is really important to, to, to precise, because the wines, you will see the wines are not tasting. We are very close to Spain, but they are not tasting exactly like Spanish wines, because we have these mountains. And, and, and in some parcels, we are nearly in, in the mountain vineyard. That's really important. And the climate I talked about, um, and the soils as well. So in Roussillon you can find many, many different soils. That's, that's what makes the, the understanding of Roussillon a little bit tough because we can find granite soils, uh, rounded stones, clay, limestone, and schist. Uh, our vineyard is mainly on schist soils. And I like schist soils a lot. Uh, I will tell you more when we will taste the wines after. Uh, and what is very specific uh, to our vineyard, you can see here, it's quite, yeah, you can see, uh, our vineyard is made of, uh, is spread into many, many different small plots, like in Burgundy. We don't have big, big parcels. That's really interesting um, in terms of complexity of the wines. Uh, also very interested and more passionate to, to work in such a vineyard because when we go in a vineyard in, in a parcel to do something, it won't take it won't take us a day. We won't have like one kilometer long rows. Uh, we will change a lot from one parcel to another, so you don't get bored. It's really interesting. But the other side is that it, it costs more to to farm such vineyards because we have, for example, with a tractor, we always spend some time moving from one parcel to another and. During this time, you don't you don't really blow, you don't spray, and you don't. So it's uh, again, uh, again, a, a quite difficult conditions to, to farm. Um, so do you have different varietals on the parcels, or do you have the same varietals? No, we have uh, many different. Each parcel has uh, like a, a different identity card with different soil, different exposition, um, different grape different year of plantation, uh, different way to uh, train the vine. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, each parcel is very unique. And we, uh, of course, we, we, we grow uh, typical Mediterranean grapes, typical Catalan grapes, mostly. So in white, we have mainly Grenache Gris, then Macabre, then Grenache Blanc, Carignan Gris. And in red, we have mainly Carignan Noir, then Grenache, and then a little bit of Syrah. And we want to focus a lot on the local grapes because they, they are the most adapted to the, to the climate. Syrah has no really sense in this part of France. We used to say in France that to produce a big wine, uh, you have to uh, plant a grape at its northern limit. Each time you will take a grape and bring it south, you, you, will, you will have uh, less quality. 
but if you bring it north uh, until the limit, not, not after the limit, then you will have a great wine. That's the case for Côte Rôti with Syrah, uh, Pinot Noir with Champagne, and Chardonnay as well. So uh, that's why Syrah is not really well adapted, but we have to, we, have, we need some Syrah to uh, get the appellation, unfortunately. So uh, we try to, to, to do something with Syrah and we manage to do so. Uh, all our vineyard is, uh, is farmed organic and biodynamic. Organic for safety, uh, because we are working in the vineyard, because of environment, environment uh, because uh, we like our vineyard and so we can't imagine to treat uh, our vineyard differently. Biodynamic is more uh, a question of quality of the wine. Biodynamic is a way to go further, is a way to find something more in the wine in terms of balance, in terms of energy. Energy is really something that we care about our farming and our wine making. We want our wines to uh, tell a story, to, to tell uh, the story of the place they are coming from. Uh, we want our wines to talk about their soil, to talk about the climate of the year, to talk about also the, how they have, the vineyard has been farmed, and all this um, to get this sensibility, this, this expression. Uh, Biodynamic is a good way to, to have this, this uh, expression in the wines. We're looking for sensibility. So that means that our wines are not, um, they are more mouth wines than nose wines. Uh, to me today, there are two different worlds um, in terms of wine. Uh, wines produced in uh, soils that could produce corn or something else than, than vine. These wines are mostly uh, more industrial, and these wines are always built in this way. I mean, you have a great nose, a lot of aromas, but then in the mouth it's like, okay, it's, yeah, it's okay, but first the nose and then the mouth. And the other world is the wines, the tower wines. Tower wines are built in the, in the other way. Nose is not the big thing. But mouth is the big thing. And to me, wine is made, especially food wines, they are made to be paired with food. And you don't, you don't eat food with the nose. You eat food with the mouth, with your mouth. So mouth feeling for a wine to me is the most important thing. Nose is great. It's good to have a good nose. It's, 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 it's pleasant. But to me, the first thing in the wine is the mouth, how the mouth is living. Because when you're eating, this is what, it, what we care about, mouth. Has, has the wine in mouth? Uh, otherwise, you can't pair wine with some food. So that's, uh, um, I really like to, to, to talk about that because uh, I find that it's, and it's, it's really like uh, the, the global evolution of our society. care about things that we see, but then what's behind, we don't really care. And to me, real wine is that. Real wine, um, we, we can read through wine in the mouth. We can feel the soul in the mouth, not in the nose, just a little bit. But really, mouth is the, the, the main, uh, the most important thing. So maybe we can start with the tasting. Sure. Uh, um, I think I told you many, many things. I, I'm sorry, I had to write because I'm um, jet lagged. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's so. Uh, she just arrived three hours ago. Yeah. Oh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe one thing I, I can uh, tell you about is uh, Roussillon. To me and to uh, more and more people, journalists and uh, sommelier and uh, uh, people working in wine, is one of the best areas to produce quality wine. But nobody knows. Uh, nobody knows because Roussillon has always been late in everything. People, Catalan people, they uh, keep saying they are living in the most beautiful area of France and uh, sometimes they say of the world. 
but they never travel, so um, and that's a big problem because they, they they never take time in the past to travel and to come in, in other countries to talk about their wines. We are like five growers of Roussillon to do things like that, like we do today. Uh, and that's very, very uh, little, and that's why nobody really knows uh, what that Roussillon is. is really uh, a, a big wine region in terms of quality. Um, we still have a very, very long way to to do before uh, you know Singapore and Roussillon becomes um, a trend wine or <laughs> not a trend wine, but uh, a very, uh, very famous wine. And I'm not sure we will succeed one day, honestly, but we don't care. So does it mean that a very small proportion is sent for export? Uh, yes, in, in, yeah, considering the region, yeah. yeah. Uh, I personally send 70% yeah. out of France. Uh, I studied like this, it was, mm -hmm. I don't know why, but so since the beginning. 70% of the wine? 70% of export. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not completely uh, chance because uh, French people are very um, keen on labels. They drink labels, uh, and so they are to me because I, I uh, in 14 years I traveled quite a lot because I'm selling a lot out of France, and uh, um, French people I can say are the most narrow-minded in terms of wine. They think they know everything about wine because they are living in France, uh, but at the end, because they don't take time to get very, really interested in wine, they, 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 Belgian people know more about wine than French people, and, and many people in the world are more open to wine, and that's uh, why I think um, I, I succeed to sell so, so many wines out of France, because people are open and they don't care if it's written or written on the label. They just taste the wine, they like it, they look at the price and they say, okay, for this price, I really like this wine and I will buy it. So, that's, that's really, uh, selling some wines from Roussillon is, is not so easy. If I, if I were a producer from Burgundy, uh, I think I had nothing to do to sell my wine. Nothing. I could just stay at home. Which is not really good at the end. I, when I when I, I created the domain, I, I nearly never traveled before, and since then I traveled a lot. And traveling is, is a good way to get maturity and also to understand many things, taste many wines from all over the world. And uh, I, I think it's 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 really nice at the end. It's really nice, tiring but nice. <laughs> what the production size right now for wine? Uh, we produce seventy thousand bottles a year. Um, which is which it could sound uh, uh, big and, and small. It's both big and small. Uh, it's small because we sell as we sell a lot out of France. Uh, we sell minimum it's 600 bottles for one country. So you sell more uh, bigger quantities. So then it goes very fast. Uh, if you if we had to sell these 70,000 bottles in France. Really tough, I think. Sorry? 35 hectares. So um, that's that's really the problem in Roussillon. To produce um, a few wine, we need uh, a, lot, a big surface. Um, but to us, it's not a big problem because uh, we really um, uh, started uh, the domain because we were keen on working outside, farming. Uh, the place I prefer to be is the vineyard, uh, definitely. Vineyard is my favorite place uh, because I, I've been growing in the countryside, I've been raised in the countryside and I, I, I came into wine because uh, one part of the job was outside. So, um, and we are very courageous, we work a lot, so to us it's not a problem to have so many vines to farm. Uh, but of course, we prefer we would prefer to have less actors and uh, for the same quantity of wine. Sure. Okay, so I think we can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I just. <coughs>
She could be hired by uh, our um, uh, professional um, organization to do some uh, nice uh, presentation. She has a lot of practice. Yeah, yeah, no <laughs> faults, and uh, no, she did really, really well. <laughs>
something, you know. If you don't even see the legs or if they are <clears throat> very fast, it means that the wine will have a lighter body. Okay, so it gives you an indication of the density of the wine. Basically, without even tasting the wine yet, you will have an idea through the color of the age and you will have an idea through the uh, legs of the density and the body structure of the wine. Everyone see the legs? But you have to stop moving the glasses. Uh, I have beautiful legs, I know, but my glasses are beautiful legs. Do you want to see? Do you want to see? Because I have beautiful legs. You saw it? They are obvious on mine now. These two are the legs. Okay, <clears throat> so for the view, color, density, clean or nose, obviously. And uh, the smell is the second uh, step. <clears throat> We have the first nose, not because we have two nose, but we have the first nose, because the, the step I'm giving you is the step we learn at the summer of your school, basically. So the first nose is just to say it's clean or not. No need to talk for the wine about, no, hours about the nose when it's something is wrong at the beginning. So the first nose will be without moving the glass, and sometimes without moving the glass, you will have all four different indications. So the first nose is like, yeah, it's clean, fresh, clean. Then the summer you move the glass, wine tester, move the glass and smell again. My question is, why do we move the glass? Is it for showing off? Oxygen, oxygen the wine. Oxygen the wine, yes, that's right. Uh, why do we oxygen the wine? So the aroma, the aroma must come out. Yes, very good. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so the oxygen could be the best friend, but also the worst um, to wine because it can oxidize the wine, but sometimes it can help to open it up. So you need oxygen to bring the aroma through your nose. Okay, so if the sommelier or the wine tester is doing this, it's for showing off true, but also to <laughs> smell the aromas. Okay, so what do you smell? And don't freak out when I ask you this question. The smell is very personal. We all have different olfaction memory. So when you grow up in Europe or in Asia, you won't have the same um, olfaction memory because we grew up in different environments, smelling different things, eating different things. So never feel shy when you smell wine to say what you think because it's personal, okay? So I want to hear you, just smell the wine and tell me what you smell. Don't keep your nose too long in your glass. Your nose is very sensitive. It can get used to a smell. So be careful, just Smell two seconds and think about it. Come again. If you leave your nose too long in the glass, you will lose, lose it because your nose is very sensitive. So, what do you smell? Citrus. What do you smell? Um, honey, little bits of white flowers, minerality. I also vegetables. Vegetables. Okay, so don't be afraid. Okay, then we have the mouse. 
your favorite part of shell. So the mouse is in a few steps. <coughs> we have the attack, the evolution, the finishing, and the legs. I didn't put it on this slide, I don't know why, but we also have the ritual of action. When it comes to the mouse, I don't want to hear you talking about the aromas first. It's not what we are asking. The mouse gives you an indication about the textures and the flavors. The aromas came after because the aromas came from your nose. Without nose, you can't taste the wine, right? When you eat food and you are a bit sick, your food tastes nothing, right? So the aromas come from your nose. It's what we call the ritual olfaction. It's coming from your nose through your mouth. So when people taste wine and they talk to you right away about the aromas, it's not really what we are expecting from the, the mouth uh, tasting perspective. We need to uh, talk about the texture. We have to talk about the texture first. So when we talk about the attack, the attack will be the really, really first feeling, the really, really first sensation, which can be shock. That means very acidic, because some of you will never use the term acidic. Nobody wants to drink an acidic wine. They will talk about freshness, crispiness, dynamics, sharpness, all those words are describing acidity on a different level, but all those words are describing acidity. So if it's very sharp, it's exactly the way I'm doing it. It will be something on your palate, very flipping, okay? If it's wrong, and very fatty will be creamy to your part. You will feel the fatness, okay? So the first and the attack is the really, really first sensation, the first second. Not the second, second is too late, okay? So let's work on the attack. What do you feel <coughs> first? Use your gum, your teeth, is the really first feeling. So yes, 
the length we say oh the wine was very short what does that mean a short wine it's basically how long can you still feel the wine after tasting it if you just drank it and you forgot about it like nothing going on in your palate anymore the wine was short if i'm talking to you i just had wine five seconds again uh, uh, before and i still feel it it's still there i still have the aromas the warmness everything is there so we can say it's a medium or long wine long finishing okay this is the length Okay, then after this, which I didn't write on the, on the slide, is about the ritual faction. Now we can talk about the aromas. Have you got the same aromas through the ritual faction than on your nose? Do you still smell the grass? Do you still have the vegetables? Do you still have the apricots, the lemon on your palate? The ritual faction could be slightly different. It could be a different perception. No? You still have the lemon. So basically, those are the steps to describe wine, okay? Is it clear for everyone? Yeah? Sure. But you, you can't, but you have to practice. Every time you test wine, if you want to improve in state of drinking it right away, keep this somewhere and try to do it <coughs> step by step, and you will improve with time. It's, tasting wine tasting is about thinking. When you do the get in the air, then you keep it kind of in front of your mouth. And the then the finishing is then when back. you feel it. Back. It's always at the back, yes. Therefore, we often get the bitterness at the end. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's usually at the back. Okay, so um, before I know, we will talk about the wine, we need to know where are our wines. Because you have six wines in front of you, which are blind, okay? Um, and now you know how to test wine, I just told you. You know Lame de Grossillon, Marjorie and I just told you about it. So you have six wine in front of you. We will start to play with the two... <coughs> no, actually... No, we will do it very complicated.